Hey, uh, Robert Matarazzi, I'm the CEO of Luca. Um, Luca is a data and software company supporting businesses across the world with risk mature and audited data solutions, whether it's data management or, or trade data. Our website's luca.tech, um, dot T-E-C-H, and, um, and you can also follow us on LinkedIn as well on our company page. Um, L-U-K-K-A is how you spell Luca. Thank you for that. Uh, what strategies does Luca employ to encourage traditional financial institutions to adopt crypto in their business processes? It's a very tricky, um, it's tricky to, to solve because there's a lot of skepticism, of course, when we're dealing with traditional institutions. So it's an, it's an education-first approach where we um, will offer free sessions just to answer all of the questions that that they might have or misconceptions or technical challenges and adopting it depending on the type of business because we do support a lot of different types of businesses. Um, but most of them are either servicing other businesses or clients with various financial reporting um, or, or other um, risk-related needs. And we, uh, we do it with a portfolio now, a very robust portfolio of data products starting with data management, so financial reporting is the use case that we, we target there. Um, so we'll do back office operations um, for a big crypto exchange, for example, or we might support a fund administrator as they support crypto funds with all of their uh, net asset value reporting. We integrate data products to make that work, and then we sell those data products as well directly to market. And so we have full trade lifecycle market data fair market value data, benchmarks, quantitative data. So it's a very robust offering. Um, and then we recently acquired a company called CoinFirm, which uh, gave us a, a great capability to support compliance, AML, um, and, uh, and all on-chain analytics use cases. So. What are some of the most recent or upcoming product innovations at Luca that you are particularly excited about? We just released a product that we call Luca Insights. It's just getting to market, and it's a uh, it's really a way to access all of the data that I just described um, in a very user friendly way. Um, so kind of comparable to a Bloomberg terminal interface, but um, uh, but it's got a uh, over a million assets that you can search through, over 2,500 ecosystem entities, sometimes over 150 fields of information. So it's a very good research tool. Hence the the word insights. Um, that we branded it with, and um, and so that's been a very uh, particularly on the tail end of uh, or on the trail of all these ETFs that were just launched. Um, a lot of the different constituents that are involved in all of the operations for there, it's become a very popular product. Um, but we're, uh, I'd say, all of our products really are are uh, are very complementary to each other. So a big part of our, our value that we add is you can get a bunch of different capabilities and products to support different data challenges all from a single provider, whether it's financial reporting, the direct market products, or, or compliance and AML. Can you explain how Luca's middle and back office solutions address the unique challenges faced by businesses in the crypto asset industry? Sure, and this is one of our, our oldest offerings. So it, it starts with uh, the infrastructure that's required in order to support this need. And so you need uh, infrastructure that can support the decimal place precision of all of these different blockchains. So Bitcoin, there's eight digits on the right side of the decimal place. Ethereum requires 18 digits on the right side. And, and a lot of the other uh, newer protocols are, are, uh, are pretty yeah. similar. Uh, traditional infrastructure doesn't support that. It's usually dollars and cents, so two digits on the right side. Sometimes core banking infrastructure will support four digits maybe. Um, and uh, but in no case is it as precise as we need in order to support blockchain transaction data. So it starts with that simple problem, but then from there, we've been uh, operating in a. And when I say we, I mean the crypto ecosystem in a um, in a global way in fractional quantities, trading assets for one another, and that creates a lot of messy and unstandardized data. So we have data products that will normalize that. So it could be something as simple as one. It, one exchange uses BTC for Bitcoin, another one uses XBT, and we'll normalize that. But we also do it over time, and we do it across over a million tokenized assets. Um, so that's a very key capability um, that you need to have integrated to do something as simple as matching tax lots if you have a lot of volume of, of trade data. Um, then it gets into methodologies and a number of other things. 
um, that we need to do in order to make the software work. And when we were solving those kind of one at a time years ago now, that's actually what um, resulted in us creating a lot of the data products that we now sell directly. Um, and so we've really been, uh, it might seem like we have a bunch of products, but they're very complementary to each other. And then very often our products are actually customers of our other products. So, uh, which creates a great checks and balances between our product teams because we're our own, our own hardest customer and we give ourselves feedback quite, quite frequently. How does Luca na navigate the evolving regulatory landscape and what steps do you take to ensure compliance for your products? So this is uh, more us supporting our customers um, than our own regulatory compliance. I mean, we have to adhere to data protection laws and, and data regulation, but that's pretty light touch compared to all the financial regulation that exists that a custodian or a trading venue or, or so on is dealing with. So we employ experts to support those customers, and our products directly support their compliance, whether it's risk reporting or compliance reporting, um, or even just auditability, um, is what our products are focused on. So it's a, uh, we do have a deep capability in that area, but it's more with a purpose to support our customers than for our own regulatory compliance. Given your background in cybersecurity, what specific measures has Luca implemented to protect its data and software solutions? I'd say it's an easy answer. It's it's all very traditional cybersecurity practices. I mean, we're we're building traditional data and software products supporting this crypto or digital asset industry, um, and so it's uh, it's um, I mean it's continuous, and it's uh, we we employ. Cybersecurity and infosec teams, and and we're constantly battling that. Um, but I'd say it's uh, it's the same way that any business would protect themselves from cyber threats that are out there today. With pen testing, red team testing, we employ a number of third parties that that uh, that support us with that. In addition to our own dedicated teams. What is your long-term vision for Luca, and how do you plan to continue driving innovation and leadership in the crypto asset industry? You know, I think it's very tricky coming up with a vision or even a mission statement in crypto because the this this culture and this ecosystem it, it evolves so rapidly. So you do have to constantly challenge it to make sure that what you put in place is current. Um, uh, ours today, I mean, it's centered around solving the biggest data challenges for all of our customers in this highly innovative ecosystem, and we're cleaning up all that data in the trail of the innovation. Innovation is usually contradictory to risk management and compliance in a lot of the products we do, so that's a constant challenge to make sure that all of that stays current and doesn't uh, oppose the innovation in a negative way. Um, and um, so we're um, constantly reassessing it, but with that, with that core theme. So we want to be um, a trusted data provider for, for all of our customers um, that stays current and that can adapt as quickly as they do with their businesses as they innovate. Makes sense. Uh, can you share your perspective on the most significant developments in the blockchain space over the last over the past year? Uh, the recent Bitcoin ETFs that were approved and now the precursor to Ether ETFs um, I think stands out as definitely one of those, if not the most significant. And it's, it's really interesting because we have these tokenized assets that are put on traditional infrastructure and traditional exchanges, but that's a very important milestone because it gives access to traditional investors to an asset that they're interested in, but they've, um, they've become more skeptical on how to get access to it due to all of the, the friction that we've had and all the fraud that was, you know, that happened in the industry, unfortunately. Um, so I think these ETFs are a, uh, are a great way for traditional investors to get access to it, get a great return on these assets, but I believe that is just the beginning of a much bigger journey. And we're seeing now funds like even BlackRock that's announced a tokenized fund now, so they're going in the other direction. I think that's more a symptom of what the future will look like opposed to the ETFs. But these are going to be a very important um, component of this evolution for a while, I mean, for, for years. Right. How do you see the role of traditional finance institutions evolving with the rise of decentralized finance and blockchain technology? I think any of them right now need to be very open-minded um, 
and embrace this technology because it's not going anywhere. And risk committees are usually, um, you know, hesitant, and they're, you know, they're trying to manage all different types of risk, and uh, can be very challenging with this technology, but it's very doable. So I, I usually uh, encourage them to keep an open mind as they're adopting it. Um, don't just think that it's going to go away, um, and uh, and hire the right people in order to embrace it because that's very very tricky, and um, and then from there. Um, there's a ton of opportunities. I mean, we see a ton of financial institutions today making very material revenue off of this, um, but it is still in its infancy. So, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the adoption of blockchain technology, and how can the industry overcome it? It's it's a lot of very modern technology that's being adopted very rapidly. I mean, if you're a bank, for example, and you haven't yet interacted with cloud technology. But now you've decided that you want to jump into doing some kind of services around crypto assets, whether it's fund administration or custody or trading services or or advisory services. Um, it's hard to do so if you haven't uh, embraced some of the other technology that you need to, like cloud technology, um, along the way. So, um, so it's, it's it's challenging. I think they need to keep that that open mind, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and they need to move very quickly, and most of these financial institutions aren't used to doing that because um, they've got a lot of assets that they need to protect um, and have very mature risk management in place. So, um, so it's tricky. I think I think the ones that are embracing it are and are investing money and in, in figuring it out, even if they don't get it all right day one, um, will stay relevant. I think any that are ignoring it won't be relevant in the future, candidly. How do you envision the future of Web3 and what impact this will have on the internet? Web3 is tricky. I mean, everyone, um, the term kind of kind of came out of nowhere, and then um, and blockchain is a very simple use case that's um, I think that's a, a very material piece of the Web3 ecosystem. But um, and now we kind of stepped back, and everyone's talking about Web2.5 or whatever term you want to throw next to it. Um, I think it's important. I mean, clearly, people and consumers want more decentralized um, products and access to assets, um, but it's got a long way to go. I mean, the consumers are ready for it. The institutions are not. We see a lot of companies trying to figure out how to bring material institutions into it. Um, I'm not really sure how it will unfold, but I think all of the above is going to be relevant for a long time. You know, I don't think we're not going to instantly have a Web3 future. Um, we're going to continue to rely on a lot of these centralized ecosystems, and they play a very important role as well. Um, but uh, it's interesting. I don't know. I'm very curious. I don't have a perfect answer for that one. That's good. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you give to new entrepreneurs entering the blockchain and crypto space? Stay diligent. Um, don't underestimate the importance of risk management, and it doesn't have to be complex. I mean, you can be a five-person company and have a recurring risk meeting monthly just to talk about your own risks in a very simple way, and that can be incredibly effective. And then, obviously, if you get bigger, you need to have more robust you know, risk management in place to operate. I think literally that applies to any business out there. Um, but I'd say that's, that's probably my number one advice for any, any younger companies or new ones. And, uh, and don't give up, right? I mean, uh, success isn't made without challenges and hiccups and failures. Um, you just need to reflect and you need to, you need to learn from failures and then keep going.